So I have a question for you. How many people in here remember their favorite teacher? Yep. The thing about teachers, and the reason why we probably call them our favorite is because we have memories and stories that we can tell about them. If I ask you about one story, you could probably give me three. And at the base of all those stories would probably be this fact. The reason why they're your favorite is because somehow, some way, they made you believe that they cared. You knew it. I remember my favorite teachers and what they meant to me and how much a part of my life they've been and the success that I've had. I'm a teacher, something that I never thought I'd be. But the older I got, the more I realized that teaching is not something you choose to do. It's more so something that chooses you, and you just decide to accept the calling. About three years ago, I had a conversation with one of my students that profoundly impacted the way I view teaching, so much so that it set me on a path that has led me here today to discuss with you something that I believe has the ability to revolutionize how we teach and to truly make access available to every student in terms of education. So, let's start here. Um, I was raised the formative years of my life by my grandparents. My grandfather had a third grade education. My grandmother had a fifth grade education. So for me to be standing here with a doctorate was something that was unheard of. There was no blueprint in my family. Though my grandparents were not educated, what they did have was a lot of what I like to call real world knowledge. They were smart people. Some of the most impactful things that have ever been said to me were spoken to me by my grandparents. One that's most memorable is Something my grandmother said to me when we were younger, when I was younger, I remember sitting across from her while she was preparing dinner, and she asked me what I wanted to be. And I told her, a doctor. Now I understand, I didn't know any doctors, right? I said doctor because I watched TV and I saw doctors, and they had a really good life. And I was like, that, I'll do that. And I, I, I guess I like biology. I didn't know it was called biology, but I like worms and animals and stuff, so. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And my grandmother looked at me and she said, you can do it. I, I said, thank you. I, I don't know how, but thank you. But then she looked to me and said this, and it was probably, when you're eight, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but the older you get, the more profound it becomes. She told me this, whatever you do, make sure you're passionate about it. Because if you're passionate about it, you'll never quit. And if you follow your passion, you always find your purpose. At eight, that just means stop talking so I can go outside and play. <laughs> but at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, when you're starting to make these life decisions, you hear those words playing over and over again. When I finished my doctorate, my goal was to go into big pharma and work in a research lab and have a nice, glorious life. Turns out that wasn't going to happen because while I was in graduate school, I'd start tutoring students, younger students. And I, uh, middle school and high school, and I was helping them with biology. And I was noticing that they didn't like biology. Right? And I didn't understand that because it's the most awesome subject on all of the planet. <laughs> right? So. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, what's going on here? Um, I noticed that it was something that was permeating throughout the school district. A lot of students didn't like this. Now, most of the students I was working with, they were from underserved populations. So I decided, because I was passionate about this, that I couldn't go and get this job in Big Pharma, that I had to go help somehow. I took a job working with students from underserved populations, but at the collegiate level. I did it for a year, and then I quit. You go, you quit? I thought you wanted to help. Let me tell you why I quit. Because I realized after a year, we were starting too late. Right? I had students who were already successful in their own right, 
they made it to this place. But what I was missing was the other 999, just like this one. And I was thinking to myself, we can't afford to throw those people away. I took seven months off, and by seven months off, I mean it took about seven months to find a job, because I was <laughs> trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and I was convinced that I wasn't going back to Big Pharma, I wasn't going back to the lab, and I met this gentleman, much older than me, and extremely wise, and he shared this piece of advice with me. He said, you, you're gonna have to make a decision, Tori. He said, you can either choose to do a job that you love, or find a job that allows you to do what you love. And that didn't make any sense. Then he followed it up and he said, if you're very fortunate, you'll find one that allows you to do both. So I started this search. It landed me back in the lab. <laughs> because the lab gave me access. I partnered up with the university where I was doing my postdoc, and we wrote a grant together with one of the labs there to start an outreach program targeting third graders at the YMCA in downtown Rochester. So we started in third grade and we're following them to see how much this helps with retention, with their interest in STEM. Seems to be working. All right. My postdoc is coming to an end and I meet this lady. She's not in here right now, I think she's outside, but that, that lady's not my wife. And she sees my passion and She's an alumni of a college, a community college there in Rochester, and she says to me, you know, you should think about teaching full time. And I go, no, that's not, no, no. And as normal, she was right. <laughs> I applied for the job, I got it. <laughs> She's right, I put that on camera. She's right most of the time. <laughs> it's on camera now, and you can just rewind and see it all the time. Probably shouldn't have said that. So, so I took the job, and about three years in, I remember I'm, I'm teaching this class. I have this student. The um, thing I love about a community college is you get all types of students, and I'm a people person. I love people. Right? I get this student, who's an older student. She's doing very well in the class, and then about four or five weeks in, I notice that her grades start to slip. I'm concerned. I'm a teacher and I want to be a great teacher. So the one thing I know that great teachers have in common is they care, and I care about my students. I care about their goals, I care about their dreams, I care about their lives. So when something is happening that is somehow, I think, impacting their ability to achieve those goals, it bothers me. So she and I make an appointment. She comes to office hours and we begin a conversation. Now, I have a plan, okay? I'm thinking to myself, all right, so she's going to come in, she's going to have a seat. When she does, I'm going to go through all these strategies that are going to fix the problem. Okay. So she comes into the office, she sits down, and immediately, before asking her what's wrong, I start talking. That's not the best way to go about it. Now I know. Okay. I start talking and I say, listen, I have some strategies here, and I start going through them, and, and then and then I, I break out the big guns. I say, and I, I'm looking through the chapters again, and I'm thinking, if you look at chapter five, and you look at figure 5.3, it'll really help you. And she just started crying. Ah. <laughs> now, I'm, I've been married for a while now, so it's not the first time I've said something. And, <laughs> and, and tears began to flow. So in that moment, you got to think back on those experiences, like what, what I say. More importantly, what did I say last time that was wrong? So I thought about what's wrong, but that, that didn't work out the last time I said that to my wife when she was crying. So then the next one was um, um, what I do. And nope, that, that didn't work out either. But the one thing that always worked was I'm sorry. So I, I said it. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. And she looked at me like, why are you apologizing to me? <laughs> I go, I don't know. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I, I finally, I finally dawned on me. All right, now here we, here we go. What I should have done in the first place. I asked her, what's, I mean, why, why are you having problems? And she said something that 
affected me so deeply that I, I really couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, it was nothing I could say that in that moment could fix the problem. But it, it was so deep that I, I knew it was gonna take me a while to really kind of think about it and ponder it. She looked at me and she said, I don't have the textbook. And I'm thinking, what's going on? She says, I can't afford it. She's a single mom and she couldn't afford the textbook and get her daughter the things that she needed. The only thing I knew to do in that moment was say, hey, you know, um, one thing I know I can help you out with is, you know, here's my book. So I gave it to her, thinking to myself, I know the stuff that's in here. Should I teach it? <laughs> so I, gave, I gave her the textbook and she left. And when she left the office, I remember I turned around to my computer and I, and I began to do a little research. Um, the first thing I did is something I should have done day one that I became a teacher. See, when I came into that position, the textbooks had already been established. So the one thing I had never done was look at how much they cost. When I clicked on the class link and went to the college's bookstore website, the cost for a new text and a new lab manual was over $430. That's a lot of money for anyone, but that's a lot of money for a single mom. The next thing I did was take a closer look at the textbook. Um, I noticed that there were all these different editions, and I'm looking at the different editions, and I'm asking myself, why is there a new edition of this book every three years? So. I'm like, maybe I can tell her to get an old edition. And I'm like, wait a minute, it doesn't make any sense. Because here's the irony, I'm teaching an anatomy class. So, you know, quick, free anatomy lesson, in case you're ever playing a trivia game. Largest bone in your body, the femur, right here in the leg. It was a femur 20 years ago. <laughs> when I learned it, it was a femur three weeks ago when I taught it. It'll be a femur in the fall when I teach it again. <laughs> So I'm like, what's really new in this book? But like, I know this stuff. I've known it. I can write this book. Wait a minute. I can write this book? And that leads me to this. Follow me. <laughs> Follow me. Follow me, OK? Now, everybody in here. Please raise your hand if at some point in your life you've been a baby. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that should be everybody, okay? <laughs> okay? Okay, All right, now, think about a baby that you, I don't know, maybe it's you as a baby, maybe it's your child, your grandchild, your niece or your nephew, your best friend's baby. Most importantly, though, it needs to be a baby that you like, otherwise this won't work, <laughs> okay? So, so think about a baby that you like. If you can't think of your own baby, use this baby, okay? I have no idea who this baby is. <laughs> I will say, though, he is easy on the eyes. I found this picture at my mom's house in a, in a photo binder that said my son. So it might be me. I'm not <laughs> it might be me. <laughs> I'm not sure, okay? But, but, but think about babies, right? You know, when they come here to this earth, not of their own accord. They didn't choose to be here. They're born to situations over which they have no control. But nevertheless, if you're thinking about that baby that you love, your child, grandchild, your niece, your nephew, I believe that every parent still wants the best for them. They want them to have opportunities, right? I think we would all agree on that. But it's not equal for every child. It's not fair for every child. When I think about the things that bother me, the things that get under my skin, the things that don't allow me to get a good night's sleep some evenings, one of, the, one of the top things at that list is this, access. 
the ability for every person, not just a baby, to have the same opportunities as the person next to them. I am an optimist. I believe that's possible. I believe especially it should be possible in this great country. Everyone should have a fair chance. In thinking about this way that I could help her, that idea again, back to, man, I could write this textbook. I was really saying to myself, I can do this. I'm going to write the textbook, and I'm going to offer it to my students for free. And then I started writing the textbook, and I was like, this is hard. <laughs> this is really tough. I, 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 I wish somebody had already done this <laughs> and would give it away for free. <laughs> it turns out someone had. I want to introduce to some of you, remind others, of something called Open Educational Resources, OER. Open Educational Resources are text, materials, videos that are offered license-free, free of charge, outside of charging to print it, which you don't have to do because this is new thing students have called computers and tablets. They're really catching on. You could just download it and they'll just look at it. <laughs> they have these things called cell phones too. I don't think it's going to work out though. Who wants to be that? that accessible, like talking to people all the time. Nobody wants that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> but when I began to look, it turns out that there was a whole host of materials. There were a lot of teachers like me who wanted the same thing for their students. And because we were all like-minded, guess what? When I contacted them, they said, here, take it. Remix it, revise it, reuse it, teach the masses. I want to put some things in perspective. It started with that conversation three years ago. And now every class I teach has some component of OER. And I only say some component because I'm working on the other parts to make sure that they all are completely OER. In that class that once cost approximately $400, $20, $430 to teach, I can now do it for 40 If you want to have something printed. If you don't, just download it to your tablet. Print one chapter at a time. Whatever suits your life. Because here's what I believe. A person's life, their goals, their dreams, should not be impacted, blocked, in any way due to the cost of a book. Not when it's out there and there's another way to do it. So I challenge you, if you're a teacher, if you know a teacher, what I found even more powerful is if you are a student, let your teachers know about this and ask them, like I ask you, if there's a way to help someone, and we can do it, don't we have an obligation to? Yeah. 